Okay, I think we can slowly start. Um, hi everyone, I'm Ishko Twasinska, uh, and we are here with my Weird Fictions Research Group at the American Studies Center, University of Warsaw. Um, hope you're all fine, doing very, you know, very well tonight or this morning, depending where you are this afternoon. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to welcome our guest, Brittany Roberts, um, and uh, from Southeastern Louisiana University. And she'll be talking about ecological intimacies in the Anthropocene, horror ethics, and the shadow of the non-human non difference. Uh, so let me just introduce um, our esteemed guest briefly. Um, so Brittany uh, Roberts earned her PhD in comparative literature at the University of California, Riverside. Um, her work focuses on environmental humanities and Russian Anglophone literature and cinema, particularly the genres of speculative fiction. Uh, she's currently working on her first book project, which conducts a comparative analysis of Russian and American horror literature and cinema, focusing on depictions of humans, animals, the environment, and the metaphysical dynamic dynamics that link them. Uh, she's especially interested in how speculative fiction genres such as horror and science fiction disrupt the human-non-human -human binary by revealing long disavowed connections between humans and other species. Her work has appeared in the Irish Journal of Gothic and Horror Studies, The Spaces and Places of Horror, Plants and Science Fiction, Speculative Vegetation, and the forthcoming collection Fear and Nature, Eco-Horror Studies in the Anthropocene, and she teaches courses in literature and writing in the Department of English at Southeastern Louisiana University. And as you probably we all know um, this is part of our our World Fictions Research Group's uh, Eco Gothic Landscapes series, uh, which we'll be kind of doing this semester at American Studies Center, Warsaw University. Um, uh, if you have time, please follow us on uh, on Facebook or check out our website. There will be kind of you know I will be uploading links to that in a moment. Uh, as you probably noticed, we're recording this session. I hope you agree to that. We'll be uploading. Um, uh, this lecture later on to our website. Um, I would ask everyone to, to mute their mics so that we are not overloading um, our computers and, uh, and the connection here. And if you have questions, I think it's best if you just note them down in the chat box and afterwards, we'll, after, um, after our guest finishes her talk, we'll return to them and uh, uh, you'll be able to get your answers. So I'm ceding the floor to our guest. Uh, welcome once more. The floor is yours. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to, I've um, prepared a uh, PowerPoint so that we have some um, visuals in the background and also um, to put up my, uh, my texts that come from secondary sources, just so everybody has um, the citation information for that. So I am going to, um, um, oh, would it be um, possible to um, get permission to share my screen? Awesome. Um, okay, so I'm just going to um, go ahead and um, start um, playing my PowerPoint here. Um, and you can also, um, I, as I'm sure you're probably all aware, um, you can um, make the, um, the cameras on the side um, smaller or, or larger if you would like to be able um, to see the whole screen. So I'm just going to um, make my camera a little bit smaller here um, so that you can see um, what I'm looking at. Um, so I would like to begin by thanking you all for coming today. Um, it is an honor to, or an honor to be um, invited to present as part of this fascinating series of talks. Um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterward as well. Um, I wanted to thank um, Pavel Frelik and Jendrik Borsta for um, suggesting my work as part of this series, and I wanted to also thank um, Agnieszka Kotwaszynska for coordinating this talk um, with me. Um, my talk today does come from the introduction to my book project in progress, which has grown out of my dissertation. Um, and the talk focuses in particular on Russia and the US, but I um, believe that the conclusions that I draw about the horror genre more generally um, in many different cultural contexts and time periods um, is still um, applicable. And so I hope that you will find um, my research useful for your own work as well. My talk today is titled Ecological Intimacies in the Anthropocene, Horror, Ethics, and the Shadow of Non-Human Difference. And I wanted to um, just briefly draw attention to this um, beautifully written epigraph here from Jeffrey Jerome Cohen and Lowell Duckert, uh, which succinctly captures, I think, um, many of the points that I want to make within my larger project. Um, and the epigraph is, all is encounter, but not all is love. And yet this world is nevertheless the one we try to know, we love, we wish to live within. 
with a stance that demands a reorientation of intimacy, even toward beings we consider ugly, mundane, antagonistic. So I will um, go ahead and begin with that in mind. We find ourselves in an era of ecological crisis. Scientists report that we are standing on the brink of a sixth mass extinction event, which some say may claim humans as well. Global climate change continues to dramatically impact biospheres as diverse as oceans, polar ice caps, and rainforests, not to mention the biospheres of cities and small towns. This is the Anthropocene, in which human decisions and activities have significantly altered large-scale geological conditions and processes affecting all terrestrial life. Non-human organisms who have never encountered humans now bear the environmental consequences of our actions. This is a moment of decision. We must acknowledge the impacts our human activities make on non-human lives and environments. We must take responsibility for the Anthropocene and the anthropocentric philosophies and ecological policies that have contributed to it. We must recognize our own complicity with and position within the material circulation of death that human activity has wrought. Most importantly, we must promote more ethical interconnections with the non-humans who, like us, are entangled in the inescapable material circulations of this planet. But how might we do this? And how did we reach the Anthropocene in the first place? My larger project is concerned with both beginnings and ends. Specifically, I investigate the philosophical, historical, and socio-political conditions that have brought all life on this planet to the edge of ecological apocalypse. Concurrently, I consider the particular environmental ends to which we might put horror literature and cinema in the present ecological crisis. While this ecological crisis touches every living being and thus necessarily transgresses both national and political boundaries, my project is most concerned with the regions under the sphere of influence of the 20th century's most powerful political superpowers, the United States of America and the USSR. In particular, I examine Cold War and post-Cold War era literary and cinematic representations of human-non-human -human interaction produced in the horror traditions of these regions. I consider how horror literature and cinema facilitates ecological awareness and how its visibility as a genre offers a powerful means of disseminating an ethics of interspecies relationality throughout popular culture. Within the United States and Russia, rapid technological modernization and scientific notions of progress driven by the state in Russia and by capitalist expansion in the United States, became intermeshed with Cold War era competition, producing different historical, social, and political conditions, which nevertheless have resulted in similar ecological catastrophes, shaping environmental conditions for much of the planet during the Cold War. In Stalinist Russia, for instance, the state emphasis on human domination over nature became intimately connected to ideas about Soviet progress, industrialization, and the improvement of human society, forwarding what Natalia Mirovitskaya, oh, sorry, forwarding what Natalia Mirovitskaya has termed a new pseudo-Marxist conception of human domination over nature as central to the survival of socialist society, which must transform nature's handiwork, displaying a boundless confidence in the inventive capacities of socialism. As she observes, irrespective of the environmental and human consequences, millions of enthusiasts engaged in the great projects of communism sincerely believed in the enormous potential and necessity of collective effort to remold nature for the benefit of the people. The Soviet Union's exploitation of nature for the benefit of social and economic growth mirrors the West's treatment of natural resources under capitalism, which has similarly regarded nature primarily in terms of how it can best benefit humans. Indeed, as Carolyn Merchant argues, capitalism's origin story moves from desert wilderness to cultivated garden. In the new story, undeveloped nature is transformed into a state of civility producing a reclaimed Garden of Eden through science, technology, and capitalism. Whether communist or capitalist, then, Western notions of progress have led inexorably toward the reshaping and inevitable destruction of nature. 
As Andrew Jenks asserts, the teleological notion of progress, the notion upheld by both the US and USSR, is its own ideology, which often obscures environmental damages by highlighting human mastery over nature and animals as an unambiguously noble goal. He writes, while the evidence is overwhelming that technological and scientific progress has caused human and environmental damage, few textbooks of modern world history focus on the costs of development. According to the narrative of progress taught in most places around the world, technology fixes problems rather than creates them. The history of technology and science in the modern world remains by and large a story of relentless forward movement toward a better and safer world. Donna Haraway similarly echoes this idea in her recent book, Staying with the Trouble, Making Ken in the Cthulhu Scene, where she notes, a dark bewitched commitment to the lure of progress and its polar opposites lashes us to endless infernal alternatives, as if we had no other ways to reworld, reimagine, relive, and reconnect with each other in multi-species well-being. Indeed, if the development of science and technology has improved the lives of many over the course of the 20th and 21st centuries, it has also led to environmental tragedies, such as Love Canal in the United States and Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union, irrevocably altering untold numbers of human and non-human lives. By focusing on the progressive aspects of science and technology and their potential benefits for cultural, economic, and political expansion, Discourses surrounding scientific and technological development often downplay or even completely obscure the significant costs borne by individual human and non-human lives. Instead, these discourses uphold what Jenks calls an abiding faith in the doctrine of progress that has transcended economic, political, and cultural differences, creating a kind of meta-ideology of global development. By producing boundaries among humans, non-humans, culture, and nature, that is by policing the boundaries among that which we consider to be ontologically different from the privileged category of the human, we obscure connections among these terms, installing a limit in our ability to think the more than human world, and more importantly, creating a false sense of separation from it. Human exceptionalism can only be undone by recognizing our embeddedness among other beings, agencies, and ontological modes of being that do not fit within and yet impinge upon the spaces we have jealously guarded as human. Our survival as a planetary community of ontologically different and yet ecologically interconnected beings depends upon dismantling claims of human superiority and making room for ontological difference. As Timothy Morton argues, thinking in the era of the Anthropocene necessitates thinking on a planetary scale, thinking alongside the myriad ontologically withdrawn beings with whom we intersect and yet cannot access, thinking while yet acknowledging the limits of human thought. He writes, thinking on a planetary scale means waking up inside an object, or rather a series of objects wrapped in objects, Earth, the biosphere, climate, global warming. Ecological being with does not mean dusting some corner of an object so one doesn't feel too dirty. Ecological being with has to do with acknowledging a radical uniqueness and withdrawal of things, not some vague sludge of Aperion, using Anaximander's term for the limitless. A circle, not an endless line, is a better emblem for the constraint yet openness of things. Indeed, in an era in which non-human lives are increasingly endangered by human activity, the reality of ecological embeddedness and of all lives' inscription and constraint within a limited finite space has become terrifyingly clear. As the illusion of human separation from and superiority over nature crumbles in the ongoing crises of the Anthropocene, the relationships among humans and non-humans and the demarcations between nature and culture inscribed not only within philosophy, but also within the boundaries of nature preserves and city limits must necessarily be reconfigured. 
we must foreground our profound entanglements with otherness in order to produce an awareness of the connections that traverse boundaries between humans and animals and between nature and culture, thereby facilitating more ethical encounters between humans, non-humans, and the environment. It is only by reconsidering our attitudes toward ontological difference, which also includes re-examining the place of the human, that a necessary simultaneous awareness of the ecological interconnections and ontological disjunctions between humans and non-humans can be facilitated. Only then can more ethical encounters be imagined and practiced. And this is where um, horror comes into play. <laughs> In my project, I propose that the horror genre is an ideal space for examining the discourses that inculcate and propagate attitudes toward ontological difference in Russian and American cultures, and for staging the discussions necessary for cultivating an ethical attention toward the non-human others and environments with whom we share this planet, and with whom we are facing total ecological destruction. Horror often depicts the uncomfortable intimacies that arise as a result of transversal materiality between humans, non-humans, and the environment, a concept that resonates with the theories of intimacy that Morton lays out in his 2013 work, Hyperobjects, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World, in which he argues that a true sense of ecological awareness often involves a discomfitting, even terrifying feeling of intimacy with non-humans. As Morton explains, what best explains ecological awareness is a sense of intimacy, not a sense of belonging to something bigger, a sense of being close, even too close to other life forms, of having them under one's skin. Hyper objects such as global warming, nuclear radiation, and toxic waste force us into intimacy with our own death because they are toxic, with others because everyone is affected by them, and with the future, because they are massively distributed in time. Attuning ourselves to the intimacy that hyperobjects demand is not easy, yet intimacy and the no-self view come together in ecological awareness. The proximity of an alien presence that is also our innermost essence is very much its structure of feeling. This concept of uncomfortable intimacy is, I argue throughout my developing book project, part and parcel of the horror genre. As the narrative tensions of horror often turn on the transgression of boundaries between humans and non-humans. The genre thus presents a unique perspective from which to explore how the non-human as philosophical other inhabits and indeed intimately haunts the very notion of the human from within. Like nature, coded as a logical, violent, and chaotic complement of the complex, rational, and structured spaces of culture, horror has been similarly coded and barred from high culture. Dismissed as a means of exploring the darkest fantasies of the heart, and frequently maligned as violent, illogical, and chaotic, horror binary cultural imaginaries of Russia and the United States and to imagine more ethical ecological futures for humans and non-humans. If traditional human-centric art forms have failed to present more ecologically sound modes of thought, then what might a genre associated with the chaotic and irrational, the violent and disordered, a genre associated by humanism's own parameters with the non-human, offer in its place. As a genre whose main philosophical weight lies in its thematizations of the murky unknown, whether it be the obscured non-human spaces of nature, of ontological difference, or of non-human consciousnesses that lurk just beyond the reach of knowledge, science, and rationality, horror is ideally equipped to explore the spaces of an ecological apocalypse brought about by an emphasis on the rational, the orderly, and the human, and whose consequences necessarily involve both humans and non-humans. 
horror's thematic investment in the non-human, coupled with its very characterization as non-human, make the genre a critical vessel through which to imagine what a non-human-centric ecological ethics might look like. Like other fantastic genres, horror is invested in the concept of the planetary. As John Clute argues, modern fantastic literatures trace their roots to the scientific discovery of the totality of the planet in 1750, a time when the concept of the local gave way to the realization of the local's embeddedness within a wider planetary context, a time that, Clute suggests, coincides with our sudden awareness of the possibility of the destruction of the planet itself. He writes, like all the genres of the fantastic, horror is born at the point where it has begun to be possible to glimpse the planet itself as a drama. A very dangerous time in the history of the West because it is at this point that, to put it very crudely, enlightened Europeans were beginning to know it all, were beginning to think that glimpsing the world was tantamount to owning it. Horror is, in part, a subversive response to the falseness of that enlightenment ambition to totalize knowledge and the world into an imperial harmony that, soon enough, would become treasonous to dispute, be Stalin. Horror and the fantastic as a whole are conceived in contradiction to the imperialisms of the West. Bound to the world, the fantastic exposes the lie that we own the world to which we are bound. Of these contrarian modes, horror is the extremist. Horror comprises a process of uncovering the true nature of the prison, which is seen to be inescapable, for the prison of the world is where the buck stops. Please close. In emphasizing horror's relationship to the planet as a whole, Clute argues that horror is a prime example of what he terms the bound fantastic or fantastic works that underscore our bondage to what he calls the prison of history, and thus question the assumptions of enlightenment and post-enlightenment thought. Contrary to the philosophies of human exceptionalism espoused by the enlightenment and its inheritors in 20th century Russia and the US, we can achieve no distance from ecological destruction as we are not transcendent to the environment. There is no exit from ourselves, our non-human neighbors, or our irreversibly polluted planet. As Clute notes, the literatures of the fantastic began consciously to evolve around 1750, just as the planet itself began to be understood as a mortal engine. These literatures can be understood as manifestations, and the figures human and inhuman who fill their pages can be understood as utterance of that sudden apprehension of the earth beneath our feet. It is this very foregrounding of the reciprocal relations between humans, non-humans, and the planet, relationships obscured by the tenets of enlightenment and post-enlightenment humanist thought that makes horror itself so subversive. By revealing our inability to own the planet, to know it entirely, or to predict the consequences of our ecological embeddedness, Horror poses a profound challenge to post-Enlightenment philosophies of human exceptionalism. Morton, echoing many of Clute's sentiments, argues that this space of planetary apprehension, the space of ecological awareness, can be one of profound discomfort, a space of enforced non-consensual intimacy with a non-human planet and non-human others from whom it is impossible to separate ourselves and, simultaneously, to whom it is impossible to gain access. <clears throat> In this space, we find ourselves uprooted <clears throat> from our humanist world, populated solely by humans and culture, and thrown suddenly into the reality of planetary coexistence on a material plane of ecological eminence ordered along radically non-human principles. Indeed, as Morton asserts, hyperobjects such as global warming and nuclear radiation surround us, not some abstract entity such as nature or environment or world. Our reality has become more real in the sense of more vivid and intense and yet it has also become less knowable as some one-sided, facile thing. However, this feeling of uncomfortable, terrifying, claustrophobic intimacy with non-humans and with the planet is ecological awareness. 
In terms with great resonances with the horror genre, Morton argues, without a world, there is no nature. Without a world, there is no life. What exists outside the charmed circles of nature and life is a charnel ground, a place of life and death, of death and life and life and death, an undead place of zombies, viroids, junk DNA, ghosts, silicates, cyanide, radiation, demonic forces, and pollution. My resistance to ecological awareness is a resistance to the charnel ground. It is the calling of the shaman to enter the charnel ground and to try to stay there, to pitch a tent and live there for as long as possible. When the charm of world is dispelled, we find ourselves in the emergency room of ecological coexistence. Haunting a charnel ground is a much better analogy for ecological coexistence than inhabiting a world. Ecological awareness, then, is not always or even often a pleasant experience. It is the awareness of both our mutual entanglement with non-human others whose ontological spaces remain foreclosed to us and our mutual entrapment on a devastated planet whose ecological apocalypse has only just begun and from which there is no escape. The feeling of ecological awareness in the Anthropocene, then, is the feeling of horror. In my project, I consider works of horror that foreground the self-world and human-non-human -human binaries in order to propose an ethics of ecological entanglement appropriate to the complexities of the Anthropocene. Throughout, I foreground several questions urgent to this effort. What does it mean to be ecologically aware? And why does it necessitate an abandonment of the label human? What does it mean to exchange a concept of humanity for one of intimacy with the non-human others, minerals, plants, and animals with whom we coexist, and who, as Morton writes, obtrude on our awareness with greater and greater urgency? Drawing on Morton's dark ecology, which underscores that ecological entanglement is often unsettling, frightening, and depressing, I argue that ecological ethics in the Anthropocene must, like horror, acknowledge and come to terms with what is ugly, violent, and cruel in coexistence. As Morton explains, oops, sorry, it looks like I don't have a slide for this particular quote. As Morton explains, dark ecology puts hesitation, uncertainty, irony, and thoughtfulness back into ecological thinking. There is no meta position from which we can make ecological pronouncements. Ironically, this applies in particular to the sunny affirmative rhetoric of environmental ideology. A more honest ecological art would linger in the shadowy world of irony and difference. The ecological thought includes negativity and irony, ugliness and horror. Ugliness and horror are important because they compel our compassionate coexistence to go beyond condescending pity. Following Morton's call for a dark ecology, I take up works that bring attention to the disturbing notion of a planet from which there is no escape and to the sometimes violent, often involuntary bonds we make with other species. I argue that by foregrounding material entanglement between humans, animals, and the environment, and by demonstrating the urgency of rethinking what it means to be an ecologically embedded human on an environmentally devastated planet, horror is a valuable tool in advancing a dark ecological ethics appropriate to the complex and urgent challenges of the Anthropocene. Though on the surface, Russian and American dark speculative fiction traditions appear quite different, these distinct modes of horror, despite their differing historical circumstances, interrogate many of the same philosophical issues. The shared concerns of Russian and Anglophone dark narrative traditions of the 19th and 20th centuries can be explained by their common roots. Both were influenced by earlier writers of the Romantic and Gothic movements, with some writers like Edgar Allan Poe and E.T.A. Hoffman tremendously influencing the Gothic fantastic traditions of both regions. Indeed, as Neil Cornwell notes, the development of the Gothic as a literary style involved a resolutely international and cross-cultural exchange. Sorry, it looks like I skipped a few slides. 
Corbell writes, certainly what is now regarded as the Gothic novel, together with the allied or anticipatory phenomenon of graveyard poetry, stems from 18th century England. The eastward spread, however, soon mingled with kindred local currents and a process of cross-fertilization ensued, embracing structure, style, setting, themes, and common sources. A reverse wind quickly wafted the fashion back to England and beyond to Ireland and America, as well as returning it again to Eastern Europe, from where some of its themes at least, such as that of the undead, appear to have originated. The Gothic then, then developed out of a profound cross-cultural exchange that involved British, European, Eastern European, and American sources, creating an international movement that drew on both global and local traditions. In Russia, this cross-cultural exchange also included influences from East Asian fantastic literatures, making Russian fantastic literature, including the Russian Gothic and supernatural horror traditions, a particularly unique blend of Eastern, Western, and Slavic influences. As Cornwell indicates, Eastern influences, folkloric motifs, and the fairy tale all fed into the Russian fantastic, along with the idealist philosophy of Schelling and the impact of the Gothic and the ballad. Fate, revenge, and the intervention of otherworldly powers, often resulting in gloom, tragedy, moralizing, and mysticism, lead this version of the fantastic to merge with ideas of a Russian Gothic. Additionally, in the 20th century, many Soviet Russian writers and filmmakers continued to draw inspiration from Alexander Pushkin and Nikolai Gogol, extremely influential Russophone writers of the 19th century, whose works often contained Gothic fantastic overtones and who themselves had been influenced by earlier European Gothic writers. Both Russian and Anglophone writers then drew on internationally known writers like Poe and Hoffman and international movements like Romanticism and the Gothic, in addition to their own national literary traditions, cultures, and local folklores, to develop their respective supernatural horror and Gothic fantastic traditions over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. These traditions then can be said to be both local and global, with their roots in both national folk cultures and cross-cultural literary exchange, making their comparison productive for thinking through literature's transformative potentials for confronting ecological problems that, like literature, frequently traverse national borders. Understanding the local distinctions among unique literary traditions, however, remains an equally important necessity. The distinct differences between the historical circumstances and literary inheritances of Russian and Anglophone Gothic fantastic traditions is one reason why horror as a coherent, well-defined genre is difficult to discern in Soviet Russian literature and cinema, resulting in its frequent erasure from Soviet literary and cinematic histories. As Lyad Nikulin remarks, Fans of horror film curious about Russian language contributions will find a USSR-sized gap in their research. Soviet horror films are rarely presented as an existing category, and write-ups on Russian horror film often skip straight to the post-Soviet period. Indeed, the genre had a hard time with the demands of Soviet cinema. However, rumors of its non-existence have been greatly exaggerated. When using American Hollywood-influenced parameters for defining the horror genre, parameters that have become a kind of global standard, Soviet literature and cinema appears, on the surface, deceptively empty of examples of what might be termed horror in the more genre-driven marketplaces of the United States and United Kingdom. However, Soviet Russian writers, artists, and filmmakers produced a rich tradition of dark, gothic, fantastic speculative fictions that in many ways parallels the thematic interests of Anglophone horror, itself a modulation of earlier global Gothic literatures, and which might therefore be considered contributions to a local, distinctly Soviet horror genre. Indeed, as Nikulin continues, Soviet filmmaking was certainly hostile to horror's moroseness and suspicious orientation towards an archaic past, but genres rarely stay out of sight for long and horror arose again in the mid to late Soviet period through strategic and sometimes daring choices on the part of filmmakers. 
The 1990s would give rise to a tumultuous but exciting time for Russian language horror, but this productive chaos had its roots in the efforts of preceding filmmakers. These Gothic fantastic themes do not only appear in texts with more overtly associated Gothic tropes, such as witchcraft, the demonic, or the haunted castle, but also in other speculative fiction genres, such as science fiction, feeding into the development of a generically unique Soviet horror that blends elements of multiple fantastic genres. In the second half of the 20th century, for instance, the science fiction writers Arkady and Boris Strugatsky particularly in their 1972 novel, Roadside Picnic, used their unsettling atmospheres, locales, and alien beings to interrogate the limits of human knowledge and agency in a non-human cosmos, in much the same way that contemporaneous writers of American and British strange stories, horror stories, and weird tales, such as British writer Robert Aikman, were questioning their own epistemological and ontological boundaries. Soviet horror, however, did not solely confine its expression to speculative genres, such as the gothic fantastic or science fiction. As Murray and Maguire has shown, aspects of horror also appeared, perhaps unexpectedly, within early Soviet socialist realist literature and cinema, where many of the narrative tropes and characteristic atmospheres of pre-Soviet gothic fantastic literatures returned in subtly altered forms as the spectral backdrop against which many overtly socialist realist plots unfolded. Maguire writes, despite the requirement for new Soviet literature to express both social realism and ideological conformity, the ghosts of Russian literature refused to be exercised. This was not surprising. It would have been more surprising had the Gothic fantastic, that is the characteristic tropes of the 18th and 19th century Gothic novel, often enriched by supernatural aspects declared or implicit, not emerged as a mode within the canon of the Soviet novel. Yet the primary survival of the Gothic fantastic was not at the censored or non-literary margins of Soviet textual culture, but within the narrative core of socialist realism itself. Indeed, within socialist realism, a literary discourse predicated on a model resurrected from the preceding century and targeted to express not what is, but what must be, horror erupts again and again, crossing the boundary of the speculative into the socialist realist novel, one of the Stalinist era Soviet Union's most important ideological tools. Thus, despite horror's surface absence on the Soviet literary and cinematic fronts, Horror was, in many ways, richly woven into the fabric of Russian cultural life, a presence obscured when reading Soviet literature and cinema, according to Anglophone genre cues. The Anglophone horror genre and Russian, Soviet, and post-Soviet Gothic fantastic traditions thus have many interesting points of interconnection, despite their seeming stylistic, aesthetic, ideological, and generic divergences and despite their differing historical, cultural, and socio-political circumstances. Collectively referring to these traditions as horror, I engage these traditions both separately and in concert as I examine specific works of Russian and Anglophone horror that investigate aspects of the human-non-human -human dynamic. In each chapter of my developing project, I balance attention between close readings of my chosen primary texts and broader consideration of their particular contexts locating each work within its wider literary, cinematic, and cultural milieu. And I'd like to um, briefly go over the, um, the main things I'll be looking at in my um, developing book project, just to give a sense of um, how this work is coming together. In chapter one, I consider the self-world and nature culture binaries that historically have positioned the human as distinct from a nature perceived as inhuman. Reflecting on how these binaries are taken up in Alexander Sokharov's late Soviet science fiction film, horror film of 1988, Days of Eclipse. I apologize, this is um, the wrong image here. But reflecting on how these works are taken up in um, Days of Eclipse, Scott Smith's 2006 brutal plant horror novel, The Ruins, and its 2008 film adaptation by Carter Smith, I mobilize speculative realist philosophies and the emerging field of critical plant studies to consider how these Soviet and American works of horror force human recognition of the non-human agencies that both intersect with and structure the human world, 
thus challenging the anthropocentric philo cultural philosophies of the Soviet Union and United States, respectively. With their permeable boundaries among self, world, nature, and culture, and their powerful representations of non-human agencies, these works demonstrate, through different cultural contexts, the non-human circles in which all humans are circumscribed, refusing any absolute breach between human and non-human spaces, and thus emphasizing the fragility of the category of human itself. They thus call upon us to attend to ontological difference in ways that disrupt the oversimplified discourses of human exceptionalism, and, I argue, promote an ethical attention toward non-humans that is not rooted in discourses of superiority, but rather in respect for non-human difference and recognition of our shared material coexistence. In chapter two, I consider how Dmitry Svetozarov's late Soviet film Hounds from 1989 and Stephen Gregory's psychological horror novel The Cormorant from 1986 complicate the human-animal binary in ways that productively reconfigure our understandings of both these terms and the connections between them. By drawing attention to the inaccessibility of non-human ontologies, the material interconnections between humans, animals, and the environment, and the unstable boundaries of species as such, Svetozarov's film and Gregory's novel deprivilege human exceptionalism and reveal the limits of human claims to mastery over other species. Refusing the neat vacuums into which Western humanism has placed the concepts of human and animal, these works of horror pose a challenge to the rigid human-animal binaries that have long supported Western understandings of the human, thus making room for a conception of difference that is non-hierarchical. In the chapter, I consider how Svetozarov and Gregory take up the question of the animal in their respective cultural contexts and how they productively foreground the ethical responsibilities we bear toward the more than human world. In chapter three, I return to the self world and nature culture binaries discussed in chapter one, considering how questions of human, non human environmental entanglement have been explored in Russian horror works produced after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Turning specifically to the underground arts movement necrorealism and its echoes in necrorealism founder Yevgeny Yufit's post-Soviet feature-length films, produced in the tumultuous decades of the 1990s and early 2000s, this chapter considers both the environmentally destructive legacies of Soviet environmental thought and the role of post-Soviet Russian horror in helping to correct these legacies. Yufit's philosophies of necrorealism, I argue, productively dismantle the anthropocentric philosophies that defined the Soviet intellectual project, while simultaneously offering a new conception of the human constituted by the relations among nature and culture, human and non-human. As I demonstrate throughout this chapter, the fantastic liminal hybridity of necrorealism subjects, in which relations among beings are always made salient, is emblematic of the kind of ecological thinking that the theorists I draw on throughout this project called for. In the chapter, I consider how necrorealism, and especially Ufit and fellow necrorealist Vladimir Maslov's post-Soviet science fiction horror film, Silverheads, explores this new conception of the human, a being that in many ways aligns with the post-human proffered by contemporary post-humanist philosophies. Simultaneously, I return to the critical plant studies I introduce in chapter one, particularly the work of Michael Martyr, to consider how the film's hybrid beings articulate a form of plant thinking useful to the complex entanglements of our contemporary ecological era. I argue that in revealing the relations among human and non-human nature and culture, self and world, and life and death through which all beings are formed, the cinema of the Nakura realists underscores a simple yet vital ecological truth that, as Matthew Hall argues, like every living thing, the human is essentially co-opted, hybridized, and entangled with alien beings, always in negotiation with other agencies, other bodies, and other natures. I argue that Nakura realist cinema thus offers affirmative alternatives to the destructive environmental legacies of the USSR. I'm also currently expanding this chapter to look at Jeff Vandermeer's short story, This World is Full of Monsters from 2017, although this part is, of the project is still a work in progress. 
In chapter four, I return to the human animal and nature culture binaries explored in chapter two. Here, considering how the complex figure of the werewolf serves as a conceptual bridge between the polarities of humanity and animality, I complement existing horror scholarship on werewolves by positioning this hybrid being within contemporary environmental discourses, drawing on perspectives from animal studies and posthumanism introduced in chapters two and three, as well as perspectives from Gothic and horror studies developed throughout the project to argue that the werewolf, by providing a bridge between the estranged poles of nature and culture, human and non-human, delivers a necessary space in which to renegotiate these conceptual categories. Examining Blackfeet author Stephen Graham Jones's recent novel, Mongrels, specifically, I consider how Jones's monstrous werewolf protagonists offer literal manifestations of both the uncomfortable ontological intimacies and unexpected joys that arise when humans and non-humans occupy shared material spaces, and when the body itself, that most privileged marker of both species being and individuality, becomes multiplicitous, ambiguous, more than one. In doing so, Jones's werewolves, like the indigenous traditions and perspectives they resonate with, cultivate an alternative manner of rethinking the human in terms of co-constitution with, rather than separation from, other animals. I argue that they thus challenge the human exceptionalist legacies of human transcendence on which so much of Western Anthropocenic and particularly American settler colonialist history has pivoted and whose destruction is vital to ethical ecological praxis in the Anthropocene. I'm also expanding this chapter to consider Anna Starobinitz's short story, The Icarus Gland, a section of the chapter that is also currently in progress. As each chapter demonstrates, the works I explore throughout this project represent both local and increasingly global understandings of horror or dark speculative fictions that elicit feelings of unease, discomfort, and awe, and that foreground forces and agencies beyond the human precisely those affects and entanglements that Morton notes must be centered in the dark ecological ethics necessary in the Anthropocene. Ultimately rejecting distillations of human exceptionalist philosophies such as self, world, nature, culture, and human animal binaries, I and the theorists, writers, and filmmakers I engage with throughout this project suggest that such philosophies can no longer be allowed to perpetuate the illusion of an autonomous, individuated, bounded human self perceived as separate from non-humans and the environment. Instead, I argue horror advocates for the importance of thinking in terms of co human co-constitution with non-humans and of privileging interrelational thinking. As Donna Haraway asserts, a great deal is at stake in such meetings between humans and non-humans and outcomes are not guaranteed. There is no teleological warrant here, no assured happy or unhappy ending, socially, ecologically, or scientifically. There was only the chance for getting on together with some grace. The great divides of animal, human, nature, culture, organic, technical, and wild domestic flatten into mundane differences, the kinds that have consequences and demand respect and response, rather than rising to sublime and final ends. In disavowing these great divides, we make room for difference, thereby halting some of the worst consequences of a series of ecological catastrophes whose root causes lie in the human illusion of transcendent superiority and whose effects necessarily imperil all terrestrial life. So thank you so much, all of you, for um, attending this talk today. I hope you found it useful, and I am happy to um, discuss this further now during the um, discussion section of, of this workshop. So thank you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we can start um, with the question. So maybe um, what we can do, if you could read out the question, uh, Brittany, and then answer it, then we'll have it for posterity for the recordings. I think that would be, um, that would be best. Sure, absolutely. Um, so let's see. Oh, uh, so the first question here to go back to the slide uh, with the book covers. Um, so let me just see if I can, um, let me just pull that slide up. Um, this was the, um, oh, let me start sharing my screen again. Um, this is the slide that covers um, 
all of the works that I'll be um, looking at within my larger book project. Um, this was the slide that I um, meant. I had a mistaken slide or a mistaken cover in one of them. This is the cover of um, Sokharov's film, Days of Eclipse. Um, and in the ex uh, expanded um, first chapter of this project as well, I will also be looking at um, Andre Platonov's short story, Among Animals and Plants, and Algernon Blackwood's um, short sort of novelette, almost, um, The Man Whom the Trees Loved. Because um, I also want to look briefly at how these kinds of themes show up in pre-Cold War era works. Um, and this is, um, the rest are the larger texts that I will be looking at um, in my main, um, in my main, uh, in my main chapters. Um, so I hope, I hope, I hope that answered the question for that one. Um, so let's see, the um, next one was, um, could I talk a bit more about how the Gothic fantastic elements survived at the core of socialist realism? Was it particular tropes, types of characters, or some particular formal textual tools that carried the Gothic fantastic through the Soviet era? or something else entirely. Um, so Murray and McGuire has a fascinating book um, on this topic um, called Stalin's Ghosts. Um, let me just pull up the slide that had um, her information in there um, so that I can give the larger, um, the larger um, information there. Here it is. Um, oh, sorry, I need to share my screen so that you can see that. Um, so, Brian McGuire has a fascinating book called Stalin's Ghosts, Gothic Themes in Early Soviet Literature. Um, and in this book, McGuire argues that, um, almost surprisingly, or perhaps even um, contradictorily, um, many of the um, themes and techniques that were imperative um, to the Gothic did survive in socialist realism. Um, in a way that almost uh, almost seems contrary. Um, she argues that um, many of the kinds of formal techniques um, that were imperative to the Gothic um, emerged as a kind of almost subversive writing strategy within socialist realism. Um, and so she argues despite the absence of many sort of characteristic tropes of the Gothic, um, that the Gothic is actually in, an integral part of, um, of socialist realism. Um, and almost a sort of subversive writing practice within that as well. Um, so I hope that, uh, that that helped answer the question. Her book um, is, is, is a fascinating project. I really recommend it. Um, the next question, I would be fascinated to hear what you would have to say about water presence in any of the above mentioned texts or any that come to your mind. Are there any particularly prominent imageries of water wherein they would translate to the specific mentioned horror um, ecognosis, to borrow Morton's term, or connection to the non-human? Um, so one of the texts that I am looking at, uh, in particular, let me pull up the um, cover for that. Um, one of the texts that I um, am looking at in the project, um, this film, um, Hounds, um, directed by Dmitry Svetozorov, um, this particular text deals with the disappearance of the Aral Sea, um, one of the biggest ecological disasters of the Soviet Union. Um, and although the text um, sort of, although the film sort of centers um, on the presence of um, now feral dogs um, within this region, dogs who have been abandoned by their owners as, um, as their owners fled in search of water. Um, much of the film's themes kind of focus on um, the, the shrinking and the disappearance of the Aral Sea itself. Um, and so although I'm not um, looking necessarily at um, any sort of more water-centric texts um, in terms of the ocean or anything like that. Um, some of the work that I am dealing with um, has the kind of disappearance of water um, in the background. Um, Stacey Alemo has also written um, some very interesting articles about um, more water-focused horror as well. Um, she has a, a very interesting um, article about Jaws, uh, whose, whose name, um, the name of the article escapes me at the moment. I apologize for that. Um, but there's definitely um, a lot of interesting work to be done in that particular area um, surrounding water as well, um, especially given how little we know <laughs> about, about the deep sea. Um, but yes, I did, um, just to echo um, my earlier point, there are many works um, with at least within um, within the Soviet, um, late Soviet um, Gothic canon that 
um, are very interested in the, the Aral Sea in particular and in the disappearance of water um, under, um, under the Soviet project. Um, and the uh, next uh, comment, um, I wonder if you could say more about how horror as a genre, which as the Gothic is often focused on what Bodding calls negative aesthetics, can help us work through the challenges of the Anthropocene. Specifically, do you see horror as didactic or cathartic in the sense that speculative fiction sometimes works to relate itself to climate change? Um, yes, so absolutely. Um, I, I definitely um, see horror as, as a means of not only of um, sort of dealing and confronting with the anxieties of the um, Anthropocene. So it's, I would certainly say that it's cathartic in that sense. Um, I do think it's a, um, it's a very helpful way of, um, of dealing with many of the challenges and anxieties of the Anthropocene, but I also do in some ways um, see it as a didactic tool as well. Um, I do think, and, and I, this is something I explore further um, in the body chapters of this project, um, but I do see horror um, as also a kind of um, teaching tool in, in some ways as, as works that, um, that teach us through both um, negative examples and positive examples um, of better ways to interact with non-humans. Um, one of the texts that I look at um, in particular, and I will um, go back to the cover here, um, this novel, The Cormorants by Stephen Gregory, um, this is a text that I think um, it focuses on a family's relationship with um, a, a, um, a sort of wild cormorant that comes to the family um, as, a, as an inheritance um, from a deceased uncle. Um, and it's a very violent text. It deals in many ways, um, it deals primarily with sort of um, ways, not, ways not to treat companion animals. Um, but this is a text that I think um, explores the questions of um, what exactly are our responsibilities toward non-human others um, in very um, interesting and important ways. And through this kind of um, the violence that, um, that is shared between both the cormorant and his human family, um, teach us not only, I think, um, ways not to relate, but also the kind of um, shared and often unexpected joys that can also come out of human non-human companionship. Um, and so I do think that many, um, many of the texts that I'm exploring in this project um, and um, sort of throughout uh, my, my larger work as a whole, um, function in both cathartic and didactic ways then. I think that they not only are um, important ways of confronting the fears that are arising um, through the particular context of the Anthropocene, but also um, are important ways of sort of teaching us how we can better um, interact with non-human others. Um, so let's see. Um, Oh, uh, so uh, yes. <laughs> so um, Agnieszka, it looks like um, you have a, a a question. Yeah, um, I, I'm sorry, I can't I can't write it down because I think it, it it's it's a comment slash question. It's one of those things. And uh, if anyone would like to ask question um, via mic, please indicate so in the chat box, and we'll um, kind of go through them in order. So I I'll, I'll start. Um, so first of all, thank you for a one, wonderful presentation. I, I really learned a lot, and um, and uh, I'm, I'm I was wondering about Morton in general and about you know dark ecology, nature without. Um, ecology etc and uh, and and uh, he's such a big name and i i use his research in my own uh, writing but they've just read a rather scathing commentary by rosie Baidotti, and i'm kind of still dealing with that with that critique of morrison when when she basically says that uh he his research is full of kind of sentimental weirdness that it, it's a kind of weirdness that well white privileged men can only kind of come up with it, it, it's a kind of weirdness that um is, is kind of flat because it does not look at um at things that other groups cannot forget so groups such as uh women minority all kinds of minorities and uh excluded groups and i'm kind of wondering I know this is not the other question, but it's, i'm kind of wondering what to do to avoid that this kind of flattening of um, of relationships, right? Because we, more than kind of, you know, is, is super useful when we talk about relationship between humans and the human and the non-human. But then again, what about 
well, very specific types of humans who interact with each other and then with the so-called nature or the environment. Um, and of course, there, it's it's not just any human that the kind of you know that interacts with human nature. So we have different groups with different intersecting, um, well, um, identities, but also you know privileges and um, and forms of oppression and exclusion and. Uh, do you get where I'm going, or is it because oh, it's yes. kind of late? Yeah. And, I, and I'm sorry, I'm not being more uh, more clear. But yeah, it's, it's a kind of question about you know the dangers of flattening our own analysis because you know your analysis, my own. It's it's a kind of question I've been kind of thinking about for the last couple of days. So I'll just shut up and I'll let you answer. Yeah, ab absolutely. I um, these are these are critiques that I um, that I, I struggle with as well when in implementing Morton's work into my own. Um, and I, I, I sort of, in my work, I feel like it's sort of, there's on, on one end, we have like the polarity of, of Morton at one extreme and then other writers like Braidati or Haraway, um, or even many of the more, um, indigenous philosophies that I engage with, um, in my discussion of Stephen Graham Jones's work. Um, I, I sort of see these almost operating at, at various extremes. Um, and I think that Morton's work is in particular, um, most useful, at least in my own project, in thinking about um, what this kind of um, negative thinking can can bring to um, to ecological thought, um, and in terms of thinking about um, how this kind of negative thinking can intersect with the horror genre more generally um, in terms of, of um, contributing something to ecological thought. But yes, I certainly, um, I certainly agree that um, many of Morton's philosophies are, are um, very specifically situated in a, in a kind of, um, in a more privileged white male space that, um, that many cannot, um, you know, that many others, it's just simply not applicable to. Um, and so I do think one of the ways to kind of um, mitigate that um, is to make sure that these things are always always in dialogue, um, never sort of universalizing across things. Um, and throughout my, my bigger project, um, I do um, try to put uh, Morton in, in dialogue, um, his work in dialogue more with writers like Donna Haraway or, or Rosie Bredotti as well. Um, and um, like I mentioned already, um, some of the indigenous um, thought that, um, that I think does counteract some of, some of Morton's claims. Um, so yeah, I, I would say the kind of broader way I think of um, avoiding flattening those differences is really to bring those differences out um, and, and to show the limitations of those things. Um, and so um, although I, I do think that Morton, his thought is in particular, um, his theories of dark ecology um, are very helpful in terms of thinking about where the role that horror might play in these larger discussions. Um, I certainly would, wouldn't take uh, his thought to be a kind of more um, universally guiding um, sense of ethics. So I, yeah, I do think that there are limitations in sort of um, making those differences explicit um, is, is one way to sort of counteract that. Um, I hope that that answers the, um, the question. <laughs> Ah, okay. Yes, and you mentioned um, some of the indigenous voices that um, that I'm referring to in my work. Um, so yeah, so one of the things, um, one of the um, so some of the things that I am bringing up um, in my discussion of um, Stephen Graham Jones's novel *Mongrels*. Um, Stephen Graham Jones is um, is a Blackfeet writer, um, indigenous writer, um, really great writer who works um, in a lot of different genres, um, and and particularly within horror um, and the Gothic. And in my discussion um, of his werewolf text, um, I'm referring a lot to. Um, many of Jones's own interviews that he has given over the years as well. A lot of his writings about um, what the figure of the werewolf has meant to him. Um, I'm also drawing on the work of um, Judy Aseke. Um, I can, and these are things um, I will, um, let me actually just pull up my project here for a moment um, so that I can um, actually um, pull up the full list here. Um, so give me just one moment while I, while I pull this up. It's a big file, so it'll take a moment to load in my computer. Um, one moment while I get down to the actual chapter. Because I'd like to be able to give you um, the titles of these things as well. 
So one moment. Yeah, so in this particular chapter, um, I do look a lot at, um, at histories, um, not only of uh, not only of settler colonialism, um, but also its um, its broader impacts on both um, on both indigenous communities um, and many of the animal populations that those communities were relying on. Um, so this is something that comes out um, a lot in this particular um, project. But as I mentioned, I look a lot at Jones's own interviews, um, his sort of discussions of what um, what fabulated creatures and hybrid creatures have meant to him. Um, I do also look, um, as I mentioned, at the work of um, Judy Aseke. Um, I'm trying to find the title of that here. Um, one moment. Sorry, I'm scanning through all of my footnotes here. <laughs> um, I also look at um, the work of Nimachia Howe, um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll put these names um, in the text here. One moment, just trying to switch, go back and forth between all of these different apps here on my computer. Um, so I look at the work of Judy Aseke and Namachia Howe as well. Um, in particular, I'm looking at um, their kinds of broader discussions about um, storytelling, the role of storytelling um, in, um, in education um, and in sort of indigenous um, thought and pedagogy, um, which is something that in that broader chapter I relate um, back to my theorizations as well about how horror can be a valuable tool um, in this project. So the role of um, the role of storytelling, the role of um, literature more generally, um, and how it can relate um, to these kinds of broader projects um, of, of ecological thought. Um, I also look, um, as I mentioned, at um, many of Jones's own interviews. Um, I have also drawn on the work of um, Gerald Visner, um, who um, is, has also, is also um, an indigenous writer, novelist, um, who has written as well a lot about the role of storytelling and sort of counteracting um, and, and counteracting some of the dangerous legacies of settler colonialism. I will go ahead and put um, his name in the chat as well. Um, and in particular, um, many of the essays that he's written about, um, about the concept of survivance. Um, so these are these are just a few examples of um, some of the things that um, that I look at um, in this particular chapter um, and the ways that um, that they are sort of theorizing the role of storytelling and of um, um, you know storytelling more generally both both in forms of um, oral literature and written literature um, for counteracting some of these legacies um, and for um, carrying across some of the other um, more traditional knowledges to new generations. Um, I hope that answered the question there. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, it looks like, um, um, Gendrik, if you wanted to ask, um, your question. Yeah. Hi, Brittany. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I have a short question. Hi. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for, for the talk. It was really fascinating. I really love kind of reconstructed your, your thought and I'm really looking forward to reading the, the book. Uh, I have a question about uh, one uh, one quote. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I was really intrigued by the quote from John Clute from the Darkening Garden uh, about the, the origin of the horror and the fantastic, how he defines it and that he sees it uh, mm, uh, as, as um, kind of emerging in contradiction to the imperialisms of the of the West. I think that's, a, that's an interesting idea and if he deserves uh, uh, deserves some attention, uh, but I wanted to ask you how how do you kind of locate this idea of your discussion of also uh, the, the the Russian uh, dark narratives, the, both Russian and Soviet, post-Soviet. Is, is this is this a you know an idea that uh, that that is useful to see similarities or differences between these two uh, traditions when looking at more when looking at them more on the kind of national literature level. Uh, that's an excellent question, and yeah, I do think um, I do think that even sort of despite the um, many of the differences between these two traditions, um, I, I do think that that Clute's observation there about the kind of origin um, 
of fantastic literature, um, I, I do think is applicable in, in the Russian context as well, um, especially given um, many of the dialogues, um, scientific dialogues that were happening at the time um, between Russia and France, for instance, um, and between um, Russia and, and England. Um, and so Klutz really referring to um, many of the kind of um, sort of major scientific discoveries that took place um, around that time um, and their broader impact on literature. And given this kind of um, sort of uh, sort of massive cross-cultural um, literary exchange that was happening at the time, um, and, I, and I'll, um, I'll go back to that um, one particular slide. Um, one moment, I just wanna pull up um, the slide that um, from Neil Cornwell's uh, book where he's sort of talking about um, this kind of cross-cultural exchange. Let me just um, start sharing my screen again here. Uh, Neil Cornwell um, really has done a lot of very interesting work in kind of tracing the literary exchange that took place um, between, in particular, um, England, Ireland, the U.S., um, and and his um, this introduction is really focusing, in particular, on um, on Russia's the way that Russia's um, Gothic literature had kind of drawn from that um, in the 19th century. But he goes back um, pretty far um, as well, back into the 18th century, looking at this kind of cross-cultural exchange. Um, and so, given the kind of broader impact um, that the kind of scientific discoveries of the 18th century had. Um, on um, many um, like British and, and French um, and American Gothic literatures. I do think that um, given this kind of cross-cultural exchange that was happening as well between uh, Russian literatures um, and Russian intellectual history, I do think that Klute's observations there um, are, are still valid, um, even despite some of the broader, um, even despite some of the broader um, differences between these literatures. Um, and there are many <laughs> differences, and so it's important as well not to flatten those differences. But um, but I, I do think in particular that Klute's observation there um, does still hold as well um, within the Russian context. I hope that helped to answer the question. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um... So I don't I don't have any further questions and I don't see anything in the chat box. So I think um yeah and, and my and my little goblin is um kind of clamoring for her mother. So I think we'll have to slowly uh wind it up and finish. So um Brittany, once again, thank you so much for uh joining us today and uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation and uh, and, and the q a uh thank you all for um coming and for your questions and your comments and uh, your presence here and uh, see you in two weeks time and uh for the next talk in our eco gothic landscape series thank you and have a nice Great. evening or a nice afternoon or <laughs> the whole day Thank you all so much. I, I um, this was a lot of fun, and thank you for um, thank you for coming, and thank you for inviting me. And I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day as well.